All right, so your new favorite website is efficientminds.com. That's my website. Yeah. Okay. But on this website is today's presentation. So if you go over where it says presentations, click on Bloomberg for all, and today's presentation is there. I also include a couple links to Bloomberg's brochures on how great their terminal is for academic environments. So there's a 2013 edition, 2016 edition. So when you click on my presentation, you'll get this file here, titled, this presentation titled Bloomberg for All. Uh, round the room, tell, tell me your majors, round the room, your concentration, sorry. General management and no. accounting. 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 Management, management and information systems. Miss Finance. Finance, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so, got one. So you see by the subtitle, this, this is going to cover accounting, economics, finance, management, marketing. Uh, I teach finance here at Sac State, so it's, it's going to be a little bit biased towards finance, but trust me, the terminal is for all, hence, therefore, hitherto the title. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to first answer the question, what is this Bloomberg? What is a Bloomberg terminal? Uh, then we're going to look at benefits, or the Bloomberg history here at Sac State how the ter a terminal can be a benefit to you as a student, how it can be a benefit to professors to help hold students accountable. Everybody likes that, right? To, right? Don't, you don't take exams. Don't look at them as exams. Look at them as understanding demonstrations. You have an opportunity to demonstrate your understanding. Okay. Uh, benefits for professors, a discipline-specific function demonstrations, and we'll conclude. All right. In all my presentations, I do an alpha and an omega slide. You may want to consider doing the same. They're actually the same slide, but the, the presentation flow is tell them what you're going to say, say what you're going to say, and then tell them what you said. Uh, while at University of Tennessee working on my PhD, I sat in on a couple of interviews of potential professors, and they would tell them, you know, start with your conclusions first, because we're going to ask so many questions, you're not going to get to them. So, so I... I Thank you, thanks to Philip Dave for that. All right, so uh, what are we going to learn today? We're going to learn the Bloomberg Terminal is a comprehensive business data and analysis repository. And, and analysis may seem like just a couple extra words, but that's important. Not only does the terminal have lots of data, but it has lots of tools to perform calculations on that data and visualizations of that data. The uh, number of terminals here at Sac State has increased. It's, we started with one in 2015. We got a dozen today. And hoping to get more. If you know any donors, let me know. Uh, you can bolster your resume with hands-on business data and analysis experience. Now, when I first did this presentation, uh, I, instead of the word business over here, where's my pointer? There, there. Instead of business over here, I had the word financial. But I am told we got to broaden the scope because the terminal has data for all sorts of business, not just finance. So I changed that. Uh, here's my foray into marketing. Using the terminal will give you a 3T competitive advantage, the training, the tools, and the time. So employers that use these terminals uh, like to hire people that know how to use them. And here at Sac State, you'll have an opportunity to, to apply that terminal to some of your classes, get some seat time. It's kind of like riding a motorcycle. Anybody ride motorcycles? Okay, well, anyway, uh, reading a book about how to ride one or watching a video, that's cool. But until you spend the time in the seat, you know, you're not going to learn how to ride it. Same thing with this terminal. You need the time in the seat in front of the terminal. Uh, trove of data analysis functions that span virtually all disciplines. You'll see this as we move forward. And I'll encourage you to check out the open lab hours, grab your headphones, and do the BMC training. Uh, you can imagine in the lab with 11 or 12 terminals, if everybody's doing a training at different stages without headphones, it's a problem. So take your headphones in there when you do that. Okay, what is a Bloomberg terminal? Uh, some of this I copied and pasted from Bloomberg's marketing propaganda or uh, uh, benefit statements or whatever, whatever you call it. I'm not marketing, I'm finance. The industry leading repository for financial and economic data, stock prices, financial statements, interest rates, foreign exchange, GDP numbers, employment, sentiment, uh, environmental, social, and governance issues. Uh, all that's in there. 
innumerable analytics tools. Here you see a little bit of my finance bias, equity screening, back testing. You can you could set this up where you have a your own stock trading or bond trading algorithm linked to a brokerage account through the terminal. So if you're really sharp, you can set that up to just print money for you, just to make money. Or you could go broke doing that. Okay. Uh, market analysis, management profiles. I heard a couple of general man I heard management out there. We'll see some stuff there for you. Has an excellent self-paced online trading program, even for finance novices. And you can connect students with employers. All right, so the history here, December 2015, got our first terminal. Uh, I had used one back in 2008 for all of maybe a week at Sachs, uh, University of Tennessee. Uh, so I was surprised when I logged in, it, it said, you know, welcome back, member since 2008. It doesn't forget. Uh, this day, oh, and that reminds me of a to-do item I have for today. Uh, replaces a myriad of free but inaccurate and incomplete data sources in SIF. SIF is the Student Investment Fund. Uh, in the past, we got our data from you know, Yahoo Finance or Google Finance or Morningstar.com. And I don't know if you've experienced it before, but you'll see different numbers on different, from different sources. Uh, more on that when we get to the finance section. Uh, in the summer 2016, uh, we acquired 11 more terminals. Uh, so now we have a full, I think we're one of three universities in Northern California that have a full Bloomberg lab. Can you guess what the other two might be? Stanford. Berkeley and Stanford, yes. So you're, you're very fortunate to be a student here at Sac State. Uh, Bloomberg market concept. So in summer of that year, since we had enough terminals, I said, well, I might as well start requiring students complete this eight-hour self-paced training. So it's part of the grade. Uh, and in fall... We used it more and more in student investment fund. We got to the point where we have Excel spreadsheets that when opened on the terminal, actually pull data from the Bloomberg service. And if you're doing a cash flow analysis for Apple and you want to repeat it for uh, Google, all you do is change a ticker symbol, all the data fills in. It's pretty cool. Uh, spring, using an MBA 220. Uh, required references and guidebooks, et cetera. Uh, MBA 220 again in the spring. Stu oh, uh, yeah, I've, you know, believe it or not, occasionally professors take those evaluations where you write your comments on how great they were or bad they were. Occasionally we look at them. I looked at them as part of an exercise for a department meeting, and it turned out students like the BMC training better than my, my lectures. So, so I, I mean, again, I encourage all of you to. You know, in eight hours, you can start, stop anytime. I encourage you to do that. Uh, I'm using it, again, in Finance 136, which is modern portfolio management. Every student will be Bloomberg certified by the end of the course, or they lose 10% of their grade. But it's only it's eight hours, self-paced. Some students, if you're really ambitious, you could, and they all get keyed. I gave them all keys since I made the requirement for their grade. So they could knock that out in one weekend. All right, so, but... How many of you think I'll get complaints at the end of the semester? Oh, I didn't have time to do it. Maybe not this semester. Maybe, maybe the word is out on me. Maybe I think the word is out. That, that, that excuse won't fly. The, we, this semester, we have a, we've got the official rollout of open lab hours. So let's see if this link works. I didn't want to open it in the same window, but uh, I encourage you to get the presentation so you can get that link. It's kind of cryptic. But this shows when the lab is open for all. Yeah, I have quite a few hours in there. I'm normally there 12 to 3, Monday through Thursday. Uh, it, you can even get an app. There's an app on for iPhone and Android for, uh, from Team Up. So if I'm out having lunch and I'm running a little late, rather than rush my lunch to get back for these damn I mean, rather than <laughs> impair my digestion and, and make myself more presentable to students so I can answer their questions more clearly, I'll whip out the app. I'll adjust the, the time real, uh, real time. So, so, and then we have students, you know, the green uh, represents student investment fund members that have volunteered time. Well, I kind of required it too. I said, look, if you get a key, give me an hour a week, give me at least an hour a week. So, so you'll have time. And this is in library 2029. Well, let's get me back. To, it didn't get me back to the same page. Okay. 
Okay, so yeah, so there's the open lab hours. There's the link. Uh, the reason I have it done through the Google URL shortener is because it tracks how many people click on that. Let's see, so I can get a little data. Who, you're MIS, right? You appreciate that, right? Gather data. All right, what are the benefits for you? Uh, first is education. You can expand your understanding. With, with the BMC, oh, and everything you see in blue font here, that is an actual Bloomberg command. Actually, I probably should log into the terminal so you can see, see that as well. So let me do that. Uh, the answer to the question is yes, I can do that remotely. You can do it remotely too if you if you get somebody to pay two thousand dollars a month for. Ooh. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. Okay, the these terminals. If you want one in your house, it's two thousand a month. If you're a school, uh, if you buy three subscriptions, you get nine free. So then it's about five hundred a month. So, so but we're, there's only one of these floating around on campus, and, it's, and I got it. Got it. And you know, and again, at two thousand dollars a month, you notice the additional security measures they have to make sure nobody's logging into their two thousand a month service that hadn't isn't paying the two thousand a month. So it gives me a little code on this card. You, there's a code in that flashing screen. You can't see it. I can't see it. But this card can see it. This is some uh, matrix type security stuff. So it's like a, a glass that you look at? It's got a camera and a processor inside that decodes the image that we can't decode. See, it's pretty cool. <laughs> There's a reason why Michael Bloomberg's a billionaire. Two thousand months with eight hundred thousand subscribers around the world. He's doing all right. He's doing all right. And where? Okay, it's loading. All right, yeah. So this, when you go to the library, room twenty twenty nine at the lab, uh, each station has its dual screen, nice dual screen monitors, and a, fa a fancier keyboard just for Bloomberg. So, but this, these are the screens you'll see when you're over there. Uh, Close this here. You can customize the layout. I meant to customize the layout just for this room. But for now, let me get over, get over here. Right, so, so that's a terminal to start the trading. Guess what you type? BMC. And then you'll have to go through, you'll have to go through a sign up procedure. The instructions on how to do it are uh, in the lab. But let me move on. Move on with the uh, presentation here. Uh, all right, so it's good for your education. I just showed you a glimpse of the screen where you, where you start the online training on the one that's loading here. Uh, the advantage is when you're done with the training, you get a certificate. You put that on your resume, you put that on your LinkedIn profile, I'm Bloomberg certified. Uh, if you want to learn even more, it has the seminar function, S-M-N-R, where you can jump in on seminars and webinars. So if you anybody happen to be going to La Jolla tomorrow, uh, you can jump in on that. Uh, Bloomberg Workshop, or if any of these webinars are of interest to you, uh, you can join it. I've only done one so far, one webinar. It was on their custom sentiment indicators, where they had a Russian hacker, I mean, a uh, Russian data scientist who would, uh, gave a presentation on how they track every tweet, tweet, every news article, and mash that together with fancy algorithms and pattern recognition, language recognition, to determine a sentiment index. Uh, that can help marketing in judging how well a ad campaign worked. It could help finance because that can be an input to some algorithm to buy or sell stock. So, all right, so seminar. If you want additional education through the terminal, you can go through seminar. Uh, job placement. So when you're done, you know, let's say I'm an employer and I'm looking for someone that knows how to use this terminal because we use it every day, wherever company I'm at. I can go through Bloomberg Talent Search. And if you look over here, actually I'm gonna have to use the mouse so it'll show up in the video. If you look over here, there's a column called BMC. You see that check mark? 
It means they completed the eight hour online training. Now here's the question I have for you. Do you see your name in here in the future? With, with the check mark for yourself? Yeah. So once you're done with the training, you get the check mark, you get to upload your resume. Now it's out there, you put yourself out there for employers to see. That's not the end. Uh, jobs, there's a command called jobs. Now that you've completed the training, you've got the check mark, you've got your resume, a little cover letter, bio, photo with you smiling, whatever you got out there on the profile, you can go for jobs, right? And you can search for jobs. And think about this, if you're an employer posting a job in multiple places, but if you're posting here, that means you have a terminal or more, right? And you're looking for somebody who knows how to use it. So a resume sent to an employer through this mechanism might carry a little more weight than a resume that just got fired in over the web. Right. Because here you know this person is touching the terminal. So we can do a little job search. Let's do a little search. So let's say I'm looking for, and again, I'm biased towards finance. Let's say I'm looking for finance in the Bay Area or something. Where is, uh, how come the United States isn't first? Why in America first? Okay. <laughs> Uh, West Coast, they go to the West Side. So let's update. Anyway, so you you want a job on the West Coast because that fits your personality and your lifestyle. And here's all the jobs in finance, right? And if you wanted to be a, well, I don't know if you can jump in right in at senior financial analyst, but let's say our uh, MIS guy is, uh, wants to do Java applied to finance, right? You just then you would click one send. You've got your profile there and send your resume, you're done. Okay. Uh, people. So if you want to cyber stalk, I probably could use a different word, but if you want to reach out to hornets that, that graduated before you, that's probably a better way to word that, cyber stalk. But if you want to find, find those that came before you, there's a command called people, P-E-O-P. -E and you want to find people that went to Sacramento State. So let's just start typing Sacramento. Not City College, no, 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 area, CSU Sacramento. Bam, there's a whole bunch of people. So then you can send a message to them. Say, hey, I see you work for the State Assembly. I want to work for the State Assembly in New York. Uh, don't tell them you want a job. Here's a tip I heard. When you're, when you're contacting people off the blue like this, ask them not do you have a job or your heart. Don't ask that. Ask, you know, give them your resume and cover letter and say, hey, do you have any career advice? If they have a job, they'll let you know, or if they know somebody that has a job, they'll let you know. But you, you're looking for career advice. You're not looking for a job. And I get 10% of your first year salary if you use that, and it works. Uh, this also helps you stay current. It's got 5,000 original news stories every day, 39,000 news sources, or 30,000 news sources. I, don't th I think they filter out the fake news or the alternative facts. You got a question? No. Oh. Please. Please. <laughs> uh, 146 bureaus, 72 countries. Is it, the command is NSE, news search. Let's do that. So let's say, somebody give me a name of a company they, they care about or thinking about. Just give me a name. NVIDIA. NVIDIA. Okay. NVIDIA. So you can, oh, and in most of the places where you're typing here, it's a, uh, Context sensitive search. So notice I just type NVID and it knows what I'm talking about. So that you can just go click right away on NVIDIA US and then it'll give you all the news related to NVIDIA. If we have time at the end, remind me to tell you about NVIDIA and the 49ers. There's a connection. Okay. Uh, fruit of this terminal use. So I did, that was a brief little overview of how that terminal can help you. Here are some students that have used those tools. Charlie, he's working full time at Fisher Investments. He was in the Student Investment Fund. I think he passed level one CFA while a student here. He's working on level two out there. Very, very proficient at using the terminal. That helped him get the job there at Fisher Investments. Katharine uh, from Norway. I think, uh, had a nice internship at Sand Hill Global Advisors. They manage millions of dollars for the university. Boon Nguyen, uh, competitive Masters of Science in Financial Analysis program, got right in. Uh, D. Lo, as he likes to be called, David Lopez. Uh, he's full-time at Sand Hill Global Advisors. He interned there one summer as well. 
uh, Charlie interned also at Sand Hill. You see a little trend here. I told you this presentation is a little finance bias. I'm not in tune with all the other departments as well as I would like to be. Uh, and then Andre, that is the dean's son. That little guy, I start, uh, that young man uh, scored one percentage point higher than me on that Bloomberg training. Fresh out of high school. Uh, professors, academics tend to overthink the questions when you're going through it. It's little videos. Every five minutes or so, there'll be a little pop-up with a multiple choice question. Some of them are, are tricky. Some of them I disagree with, and that got my score lower a little bit. So, But anyway, he, uh, he's at Berkeley, and he wanted to join their student investment fund. They said, well, you know, you, you got to be a junior. And he's just starting, a freshman. He said, but I'm, I'm Bloomberg certified. They said, okay, well, you're in. Another fruit of uh, uh, terminal usage. Uh, future fruit. Uh, Bashar Zachariah, he's a senior portfolio manager or something. He's got some fancy title at CalPERS uh, in the Emerging Market Bonds Department. And he says they have trouble recruiting uh, investment officer one employees because at CalPERS they have a high bar or high requirement for financial analysis experience. It's an entry-level position that requires a lot of experience. They have trouble filling it. Now, me being a contributor to they're managing my retirement, I'm glad they got a high bar, right? I don't want them mismanaging my retirement, okay? But it does lead to a hiring problem. So you can rack up the hours right here while you're in school. So then you can take their peanut salary because that's what you expect coming out of school anyway, right? Maybe you can negotiate a little more saying, you know, I've got the experience you talked about on the terminals that you have. So, so Bloomberg, Bloomberg proficient Sac State graduates should fit that in investment officer one position nicely. Right? You're not demanding the salaries like you came from Stanford, but you got the more, actually more experience than someone from Davis. So moving on. For professors, uh, it's easy to add to the syllabus. Everybody's doing it. How many are having a, a flashback of their mom saying, well, if everyone jumped off a bridge, would you jump off? Uh, this is a list of other schools that are, are doing or integrating Bloomberg usage in their courses. You'll see Sacramento State here somewhere. Yeah, that's me. Both of those are me. Okay. So, but lots of schools are doing it. Everybody's doing it. Okay, I told you, everybody's doing it. Wait a minute, did I once again forget to, hang it. Next time I click on the link, I'm gonna do right click. Where was I? All right, so professors, everybody's doing it. Uh, if at the end of the semester, it provides a, the Bloomberg provides a detailed report. Uh, getting through the training is pretty easy. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. I set the bar. Not too high. I, I told students you got to hand in. There's four modules: uh, economic indicators, currencies, fixed income, and equity. Uh, I give them four staggered due dates. I say you got to meet the due date, and you got to get at least sixty percent. If you miss any of those things, I dock you ten percent. So you'll see one person here. Uh, they got a fifty-three percent at the end. Maybe they retired semester near the end. So instead of getting hundred percent credit for the assignment, they got ninety. This other person, and I know who this is, I'm not going to name names, handed in late and scored 44. That, that's related. They, they, that's, for that person, that's not a surprise. So they got 80%. So I've been trying to convince professors to do this. Uh, having a little trouble getting buy-in. I guess it's like, well, I haven't been through the training myself. You don't have to go through the training. Just get the report. Let them do it. Uh, that list of schools I had up earlier, I went to a Bloomberg for Education conference in San Francisco over the summer, and most schools I talked with, they're, they're, they're trying to push that in as soon, as soon as you get into business school, go through this. Like that kid who scored higher than me on the test. Anyway, All right, discipline-specific functions. Again, I'm a little biased since I'm finance, so you'll, you'll see, like for accounting, I won't have as many functions as I will for finance, <laughs> I'm a little biased, but uh, there's a lot of overlap here too. So just kind of keep in mind as I run through these functions, whatever your discipline is, there may be some overlap with your discipline. All right, accounting, whack, weighted average cost of capital. Uh, 
at some point you might have been taught you got to combine the cost of equity, cost of debt, preferred stock, how much of the firm is financed by age, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the command to find whack in Bloomberg is just whack. And we'll, we'll check this out. Bam, you're done. Okay, so NVIDIA is financed mostly by stock uh, at a cost of 15%. That's obtained by the capital asset pricing model. Uh, their debt has a cost of 2.8. This includes the AT means after tax. You can click in there and it'll show you the actual construction of the measure. So a tip for you if you're a student and you're doing some report and ask for whack, don't just tell the professor that, yeah, I got the number from Bloomberg and it's 14.8%. You might want to be a little more thorough and explain the, the breakdown, the pie chart here, how the numbers got there. You need to know how those numbers got there. So don't just say 14.8 because Bloomberg said so. Okay. That's one function for accounting. Uh, FAs is another good one. Financial analysis. And actually, just to, this morning, it, the thought occurred, have, have any of you used Mergent Online or Value Line? No? Okay, these are other data services that the university is currently paying for, but I'm going to tell them, don't buy it anymore. Because we've got it all right here. Uh, I've seen one student in the lab with the Bloomberg screen on the right and the Value Line screen on the left, and they have different numbers. And I said, yeah, we went through this with the Student Investment Fund. But how do I know this, these numbers? are correct because it costs two thousand dollars a month no the real reason why i know it's correct is let, let's take this revenue number if you keep clicking just keep on clicking click some more click some more you can get to the actual spot on the financial statement that was filed with the government so th these numbers are god right? these are correct okay this is it right so value line or yahoo finance or google finance has a different number they're wrong right because these numbers come right off the actual filing with the government. That's pretty cool. Uh, the, if you notice, for each statement, they have adjusted. Now adjusted, that's adjusted by, not some, some random hack, that's adjusted by uh, paid people by Bloomberg, paid professionals that'll take and unwind all the trickery you accountants put into your statements, trying to hide costs, where all this stuff you're trying to do, right? they pay people to adjust it, and then they uh, explain how they adjusted it here, I think. I think that's how it works. We have your gap, we make some adjustments to that gap crap, and then we can reconcile it. Okay, so that's an accounting function. Uh, financial ratios, uh, there's a tab here called ratios. So all the key ratios on the company are there. Pretty cool. Okay, so that's a few functions for accounting. Economics, they have some cooler functions, I think. They have more, more pictures. If you want to see who owns the United States, okay, there's a command called debt. And, and I like the pie chart better. Pie charts, well, actually I just noticed something on the line chart, the Federal Reserve amount really shot up here at least it's leveled off i'm glad to keep going but anyway as of today you know china owns most of our debt and then japan and then i'm surprised ireland's there and the cayman islands there's probably some tax avoidance going on with the ireland and cayman for sure but anyway that's that's one economics function if you're concerned about the international debt economic trade flow here's a cool command if you are doing some type of research or answer some question in your economics class about trade flow, you can see how the, the total trade with the given trading partner. And let's see, the size, the order is by total trade. So I think the size of each box is, represents the total amount of trade with all countries. And so Mexico doesn't trade as much as US and China or the Netherlands. Uh, Germany, we get the little, those crappy BMWs that break all the time. I have, a, I have a painful story about that, a personal painful story. Where's Japan? Because now I'm, now I'm Toyota products. Where's Japan? Okay. Good. Yeah. So I like that. All right. So that's a couple economics. Oh, uh, economic world statistics. Now, um, it's unfortunate the econ professors aren't here for this because they would probably drool on their desks if they saw this. Look at all that statistics. GDP growth, uh, 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 consumer price deflators, uh, 
the monetary sector, government sector, uh, personal sector, jobs, retail, anything you want, economics, it's there. Commodity price forecast. Now, if you care about the price of oil, oh yeah, this would be a good question for the class here. Uh, so here, it takes the average forecast from a bunch of analysts and puts together these tables. Look at oil. Look at the, the, the number for oil. Do you think Tesla wants to see this number go up or down? Up. Uh, is it going up? So, no, not really. No, not much. Right? So 55, 54 the whole time. So what's, what's, how is Tesla going to make money again? Okay, now, now I'll call. <laughs> okay, I don't know. I mean, but if we look at the, this is where the financial analysis comes in handy. If we look at just some key, key stats on them, let's take a look at, say, cash flow. Do they generate money? Sure. No, they lose money. They lose cash every year. Okay, now how do they get, get that? Oh, and I'm missing one here. Let's see here. We can, yeah. This this is kind of stuff I point out in the finance class. If we look at the shares outstanding in addition to this, so you one might think, how can you continually lose money and still operate? Well, if you find some suckers to keep buying your stock, notice the green line is the number of shares outstanding. If you keep selling shares at ever higher prices, that will fund your loss and losses in your operation. I have students that are Tesla fans. They hate when I show this, but I mean, it's the data. That's what's happening. They're losing money, and to cover their losses, they're selling more stock. Maybe they'll turn it around someday. Okay. All right. So I guess that's a good segue into finance. Uh, and again, there's overlap in these functions, like company description. Uh, everybody can use that. If you're analyzing real world companies, you type in DES description, give you a snapshot on the company. Uh, you know, who's the management and his family <laughs> next again, you know, so you sell stock to acquire the stock of a company you and your family also own solar city. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm a Tesla hater, but they're up today. Well, I'm not a hater. You're right. I'm, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Cause my, my auntie used to say, you can't hate anyone or anything unless there's hate inside of you. You need to address that first. I dislike the notion of losing money and then uh, continually and selling stock to, to fund your losses instead of improving your operations. I, I dislike the notion of overpaying for a company and, and telling the public some BS story to explain it when the real answer is this will enrich me and my family. Yeah, so, so that's why I have some... <clears throat> Some issues with Tesla. I don't hate them. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to make money. They, they, oh, okay. So new search. Here's a good one. This is a good one. See, it's good. Uh, when I gave this presentation Monday, uh, somewhere there was a news story about Tesla promised to deliver uh, 2,000 cars in September, and they, they delivered 150 or something like that. And so. It's kind of like a Ponzi scheme. They keep promising this stuff. So you're going to change the world and make lots of cars, make lots of money, but you only deliver you know, one-tenth of that, one-twentieth of that. I, anyway, so there's a news story in there about their not delivering many cars. Relative value, graphical relative value, another cool command. So let's compare Tesla to some of its competitors. You can do relative valuation here. Uh, the larger the dot, the larger the market capitalization. Uh, so we're looking at Tesla. Tesla is bigger than Ford, General Motors. So their dots, well, it's about the same size here as General Motors. Uh, look at the axes here. That's what's important. We have earnings per share growth up here and sales growth. I don't see how their earnings per share growth is that high when they're losing so much money, but that'd be something worth further investigation. But naturally, you want to be up and to the right here. You want higher earnings per share growth, you want high sales growth. I can understand why their sales growth is high. They're not starting from 500,000 cars like General Motors are starting from. Oh, which reminds me, well, we'll get to that in the marketing section. But you can look at number of units over time in addition to just revenue over time. 
Graphical cross section, another command. Next. What is this one? I haven't used this in a while. Was it? Oh, so this will this shows. Well, it, it probably can't show Tesla's price to earnings because, uh, because it's, yeah, they got like because they don't have any earnings. So let's use Apple here instead. Apple would be better. All right, so there's Apple in the middle there. Its price to earnings ratio is. 17.48. So it's among its peers, it's pretty pretty fairly valued. Investors are paying $17 in market price for one dollar of earnings. That seems reasonable. Okay. Uh, equity screener. This one we use a lot in the student investment fund. And we have a screen that we employ there. Uh, you start off, if you look at the just under where it says field, or right here where it says matches, the security universe. How many stocks are Bonds, equities, whatever there are to choose from, nine hundred thousand. Uh, if we were to ask, if we were to ask our student investment fund members to analyze all nine hundred thousand, they would never get it done. So we filter. We want they got to be trading. Uh, they have to be the primary security. Got to be on a U.S. stock exchange. They got to be bigger than a billion. That gets down to twenty four hundred. And from there, you could see the results. And from this page. Students can do take this little action here, output, all securities in Excel. After they do that, they have an Excel sheet with all these dimensions, and they do some calculations to assign a score to each stock. And we call that the present score. What, what does the company presently look at? And then from there, the ones that look the best today, we, we look at their past and then their future. You don't have enough time to look at the past, present, and future at all. 2000, but we, we split the group up into groups of uh, in, into 10 sectors. Each sector gets uh, uh, their top 10%. Each sector has to put 20 or so stocks to take this score and add a couple other scores to it to figure out which stocks are the best investment. Uh, another thing you can do with this so, all that calculations and stuff I described you would do in Excel, you can have the terminal do it too. If you know how to enter in, the right formulas. See, we hit no there. I don't believe no. Uh, if you there's, you can enter in formulas, and what you'll see here, I got this present score relative to your sector. Are you in the top five percent of the, the metric we developed in the investment fund? And when you see here in a moment, instead of two thousand stocks, it's going to be a couple hundred. Give me a second. It's thinking. Yeah, it's taken. It'll do it. Any questions so far? So we can do the um, training here at the school just up the room? Yeah. Anytime. anytime. Any, you get the count. See when it's open. Yeah. Go there anytime. Uh, you could do it at home too, but that'll cost you $150. Oh, see, 192 stocks here. So that, that what was $2, 2400 is down to 192 I use this to check what the students do in Excel. I mean, why, why do I want to? copy and paste formulas all around Excel when I can just get it right here and check their work. All right, but you need to get Excel touches too. And students also need to learn how to do this programming here too so they can compare both. Uh, back to the $150. Once we get up to four licenses, remember I said earlier, buy three, get nine free. If you buy four, I think you get 12 free. But in addition to that, you get unlimited credits to take the training on through a web browser anywhere. But for now, to do it for free, you gotta go to the lab. You, you can pay 150 to do it at home. Uh, in the future, when you line up someone to contribute another 24,000 a year, we'll be up to four licenses and we'll have unlimited credits. So is it something like with Illustrator, I wanted to book there for, I only had like an hour. You can do that. You can, just do it. You can start, okay. stop. You can stop in the middle of each module. You can start and stop at any time. Amount of time that it takes for a student to do that. Does that factor into what you think about? Uh, what you're talking about from the report I had up earlier? The there, there's I went through it myself, so that impacts what I think about it quite a bit. Uh, 
there's a there's two one hour modules and then two four hour uh, is that right? Two one hours and two three hours, something like that. Eight hours total. I schedule it so you know you got like a week to do a one hour training. And you get three weeks to do three. So they have there's there's sufficient time to do it. Where you ask me up. Uh, well, forget what I think about it. As I, when I was reading those MBA students' evaluations, you know, it was, it was common that they said, hey, this is better than his lecture. It didn't hurt my feelings. I'm unmoved, right? I'm free from that bondage. <laughs> Does that answer your question? I think it's worthwhile. I think everybody should do it. If for nothing more to get the checkbox, but it does expose you to all sorts of the currencies, economic indicators, bonds. Uh, get you some touches on the terminal. And I frequently see students in the lab using the terminal for other classes. So it's not just for a student investment. Okay. Uh, back test. Is that what I hope the student investment fund in the, in the um, terminal, the library? Well, towards my, no, they don't hold that. The student investment fund happens every Monday at 3 in AIRC or ARC 1013. It, it probably should be held in the Bloomberg room, but you know, I kind of, I'm in the background this semester, actually for a while on the investment plan. I wrote the book on it, moving on to other things, moving on. Uh, but I'm in the labs so often, they, you know, so if you have any questions about the process or how to, I'm there nine hours a week, triple what my colleagues spend on that. Oh, is that, is that recording? All right, so say you got this strategy, and you want to back test it or, or any strategy. So before you, I mentioned earlier, you could link a strategy like that and you could, to a brokerage account and said, okay, do this every month, buy whatever top 100 stocks, do that every month. You could do that. But you probably want to test that strategy over time first before you put money on it. So I was messing around with my side gig. I came across this particular strategy. Where's the finance guy? You got to be, you got to be all over this right now. You'll be all over this. Here's a strategy, total return, 1,200% since 1996 compared to the market at 300%. This is where somebody would ask, okay, so that looks good. You got, you got alpha 6 or 7% above the market, 6% above the market every year. How much money have you put into this strategy, Dr. Moore? Anybody want to ask that? Zero, because I, you know, I got to pay off some bills first. You know, so. <laughs> I just have index funds. That's, that's the sad thing. I teach all this finance and all this portfolio management, stock analysis, I do all that, and then I buy an index fund. Okay, that's uh, equity back testing portfolio. If you want to have a deep analysis of what's in a portfolio, this is a cool tool. So let's look at the student investment fund portfolio. And we're going to compare it to our benchmark, which is the S&P 500. We're going to do it by sector. Hit go. And we're going to want the attribution summary. Oh, and am I looking through? Am I looking through? I want to look through. What these settings do is the benchmark and our student investment fund also hold some mutual funds. So this tool has the ability when, when it's parsing out how much do you have in healthcare, how much you have in infotech, how much you have in industrials, it can look into those funds at the individual stock holdings and categorize them appropriately. You can do it. We'll do it. And I didn't want holdings. I wanted attribution and I wanted summary. It's thinking. Uh, okay, so here you can see that relative to our benchmark, we had too much in cash. Market's been going up lately. That particular allocation decision hurt our overall performance. Okay, let's take a look here. Uh, healthcare. We were underweight healthcare at a time when healthcare was apparently going up, so that hurt us a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, we, uh, just a little bit. But the real problem with healthcare is we picked the wrong stocks. Selection. Uh, what, what have we done well in? The materials, we were overweight. Uh, 
that didn't make a big difference, but we picked the right stocks. Wherever you see a positive number here, that means we picked the right stocks. Wherever you see a positive number here, we were, it was a good thing to be overweight that sector. That's just a tip of the iceberg of the depth of analysis you can do on a portfolio. Uh, there's, there's scenarios here you can simulate. Uh, another Greek debt crisis, you can simulate an oil shock. You can, and then this tool can tell you, uh, okay, uh, this tool could, could tell you, you know, replace these four stocks and put these five in there or something. RV, so if, and this is one that will span disciplines. So let's say you're doing a report on Apple and you wanna compare Apple versus its competitors. Here's, and there's three different, several different ways you can define competitor. There's curated list, which is smaller. You can go by uh, some algorithm that Bloomberg identified. You can go by, uh, I think we just go by in industry classification. And, and then you can create custom fields. For example, let me do, give you an example that happened, came up yesterday. Uh, let's do Wells Fargo. Econ student came in and was asking me, well, how many branches? I, I want to look at the number of branches of banks and among other data. Well, you can create a custom field here. You can, so here you can get your list of banks, comparable banks, and to get number of branches, guess what I type in here? Branches. If you type in branches, number of outlets and branches right there. The latest filing and then go. To, now these, these numbers are kind of rounded here. If you export this, where is output Excel? It should pop open an Excel window. Right there with more, more precise numbers as you can see, see there. Right. So, but that's just one data point. There's all sorts of data that you can obtain and wherever you're thinking of, you can type in that box and add it. And if you want detailed descriptions of what fields are available, you just go to the fields command where it says enter query, just type whatever you're thinking. I don't know, something about, anything about revenue, what we got on revenue, whole bunch of stuff. Click in there and it'll even tell you how it's calculated. Pretty cool. All right. Uh, well, all right, so with the, Relative valuation company uh, command that shows you, you know, uh, a cross sectional comparison like Wells Fargo's price to book value is is in, is kind of uh, is apparently right on right at the median. It's net interest margins a little lower. Uh, you want you would like that blue dot to be over here, you'd like to have higher net interest margin. You want a bank that is charging more on loans and paying little on deposits. That's what you want. Uh, so that's cross-section. You can also do the EQRV to see, okay, well, how's Wells Fargo doing with respect to itself over time, right? Same type of graphs, but this is, this is only Wells Fargo and over time. So you can do it cross-sectionally, you can do it time series. A uh, foreign exchange forecast, this was a cool one. Uh, when we got that first terminal in 2015, uh, Angela asked if she was heading to Spain the following summer, and she asked should she exchange U.S. dollars for euros now or when she goes on vacation. I said, I don't know. Let's see what the exchange rate forecast is. And at the time, I did, did the quick calculation, and it looked like, well, you'd spend about three, you could spend three cents more per euro if you wait. So I don't know if she waited or bought right away or not, but... I probably would have just waited. How accurate is the forecast? The future is unknowable. By the way, that's a great question. How accurate is the forecast? The future is unknowable. I haven't done any historical tests to see how accurate this is. I wonder if there's any in here. That would be a good, good Google search. I'm sure there's studies on it. Yeah, you can always hit the F1 button. And, uh, well, yeah. And maybe somewhere in this documentation, there's information on accuracy or accuracy studies. So I'll let you do that on your own. Good luck. Uh, Excel templates. I mentioned that there's a library of templates built into the terminal and that actually pull data from Bloomberg. This is an example of one. It does a discounted cash flow analysis. 
where all you'll have to do is change the ticker symbol and it'll redo the entire analysis. Comes in handy. Uh, like for the investment fund, we get to that top 200 stocks and we want to see, okay, that's a present number now. If we want to forecast cash flow, see how much it's worth, we can use this to run through those 200 real quick. Well, well, I was still thinking about it. Let me move on. Okay. Uh, that's Excel templates. Oh, okay, management. Uh, yeah, so if you're trying to save the world and you care about environmental, social, and governmental issues, there's, there's commands for that too. So, ES, so let's look at Apple. All right, you guys in the back on your laptops, you downloading videos, tying up the bandwidth here? All right, so here it has metrics on environmental issues, uh, women employees management, uh, women employees management ratio, is that 0.88%? 32, this must be in some other number, but uh, unionized, not, independence of directors. So if you're really into that, I'm not into the, I'm trying to make money, I'm not trying to save the world. But there, I think there are some studies saying that being, you know, ESG aware or compliant or whatever does lead to higher returns going forward. But again, the future's unknowable. Uh, another management function, mergers and acquisitions. We'll stick with Apple here. Uh, you may have heard a little bit about Apple and some of its big acquisitions, but when you look at this, or when I looked at this, I said, I didn't know they were that involved in so many different mergers and acquisitions. Okay. It lets you know whether it was pending, proposed, completed, pending, or uh, some of them they have. Uh, I thought there were, if you go back far enough, there's some that'll show when, when they abort it. Or, or, so, so if you're doing some research and management on mergers and acquisitions and need data, you can get from here, the terminal again. Uh, Bico, business company, business intelligence company primer. Right, so Bloomberg, again, with all their paid analysts there, they have what's called business intelligence. They have a primer on each company. Gives you information about the company, earnings trends, uh, market analysis, et cetera, all kinds of stuff. So if you're doing a case study on any given company, I'd start here. Right. Okay. okay, management and then marketing. Uh, supply chain analysis. I see we're running low, running out of time here in a minute. So if we do SPLC, uh, I don't care about Wells Fargo suppliers. Uh, let's do Apple again. So if you're in marketing supply chain area, you can look at Apple, and on the left you'll have all their suppliers. On the right, all of their customers. The green indicates, or the color indicates, the health of the suppliers or the customers. In this particular case, green means the latest sales surprise. So everyone in green sold more this last period than the analyst forecast. If you're looking at a company and you see a bunch of red on either side, you got an issue. But not only can you do that, we can look at this particular supplier and then look at its suppliers or the supplier of that. So you can look at the supplier or the supplier supplier or the supplier of the supplier supplier. That reminds me of an old joke about the cursing in the Compton church, but that's a long joke. You have to ask me another time. All right, so that's one marketing function, supply chain analysis. Uh, another, another cool marketing, and also a finance function. I did say there would be overlaps. Is the revenue by product. It's one thing to you know Apple's revenue year by year, but are they selling more computers, more phones? What's the breakdown? What's the mix? And it also shows here number of units sold. That becomes more important for things that, that like commodities, like oil. You want to know how many barrels of oil Exxon is shipping, uh, shipping more or less. Okay. Uh, you can also go by geography. Okay. I don't do it here, but if we were to look at the tobacco companies, we would probably see how the sales in the U.S. really doesn't matter. So all this, all the litigation and lawsuits and settlements they had to do over the years, they're selling more cigarettes in China anyway, so it really doesn't matter. So, 
but you can you can get that kind of information here. Uh, relative valuation, we already saw that. Okay, and that. So the conclusion, you've seen this slide before, and I stole the title from someone. I had an MBA student, and they did a team, two or three person presentation, and he was the closer. And this slide, he jumped out, okay, now what do we learn today? And I woke everybody up, I thought that was a good thing. What, what do we learn today? We learned Bloomberg is comprehensive data analysis repository. I showed you how number of terminals went from one to 12 here. Showed you how students improved their resume, got hands-on experience, and got good jobs or good placements at good colleges. Uh, trove of data and analysis functions. I didn't dive deep into the simulating a portfolio, simulating a crisis, and having it recommend what stocks move in or out, but it can do that. Uh, so check out the open lab hours, which were mentioned earlier. Grab your headphones, plug it into the keyboard. There's a fancy keyboard there to have a headphone jack. Plug it in there and type and get started on BMC. There's instructions by each terminal on how to start the training. Creating an account on a terminal and the training on terminal, all free. And it's, you could probably do it with no documentation in front of you. It's pretty straightforward, just paying attention to the screen. No food or drink allowed in the lab. And I think that's all I have. What about the coin earnings training? Oh, 49ers and NVIDIA. Okay, so on your favorite website, what's your favorite website? Um, yeah, efficientminds.com. So if you're at the home page there, you'll see an article. I, I, I reposted an article. It's about a hedge fund betting on artificial intelligence. And, and I quoted a few things in here, but uh, there was an index fund, or there was an index tracking 12 pools that employed technology. So you're kind of calculating the average of all the hedge funds doing this, and they still couldn't beat the S&P 500 index. So you're still probably wondering how is NVIDIA and hedge funds, or NVIDIA and 49 So that made me think of the gold rush. Who, who really made money during the gold rush? The suppliers, the shovel makers, and what's the name of the 49er stadium? The, the new stadium. Big pants. Levi's. Levi's, which made a lot of money during the gold rush, right? So, NVIDIA. So here, this article is talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning being applied to uh, hedge funds and stock picking strategies. NVIDIA is your Levi. It's your shovel maker now because they make the processors or they're the leader in processors for doing artificial intelligence and machine learning. So don't invest in the hedge fund. They don't beat the index. You know, invest in the, whoever's making the, the shovels and pants for artificial intelligence. Bam, that's a mic drop right there. That, that answer your question? Yeah. yeah see, you, you're wondering how, how the 49ers and NVIDIA connected. Now you know. Any other questions? Huh? No, the football team, the actual. Or the actual 49ers, yeah. Well, Levi Stadium kind of, I mean, they're, they're all kind of non-separate.